glad you could join us today on Earth Power. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayola Kasim. Nature is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history. That is the warning from a landmark new report from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the summary of which was approved at the seventh session of the United Nations Bodies Plenary last weekend in Paris. Three years in development at a total cost of more than $2.4 million. The global assessment draws on nearly 15,000 references, including scientific papers and government information. It is also the first global assessment ever to systematically examine and include indigenous and local knowledge, issues and priorities. The overarching message of the assessment is that it is not too late to save biodiversity if we acted now. So today we start with some efforts individuals are making to help nature and of course break down other messages in the global assessment. Do stay with us. This is a red capped mangabe. He's a rescue actually. I got him about four months ago. Um, one of the hunters, these hunters that catch wildlife, caught him. And because he was small, nobody would eat. So he kept him. But he was kept in very deplorable conditions. And then somebody got to know about it and told me. So I went to meet the hunter and convinced him, not cheap, to give him up to me. Yeah, so he's been with me now for about four months. And I have, um, I treated him. He was quite ill. He had scabies. If you see his fur, his fur is still growing. He had scabies. But I treated him and he's gradually coming back to what he should look like. And then, of course, food and all that. So he's getting much better now. Dr. Mark Ofua is a small animal veterinarian and a wildlife enthusiast who likes to call himself a conservationist. One thing I noticed was our negative attitude to wildlife. It's quite appalling and it's, 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 it's sad. We kill anything that moves. Now, a percentage we kill for food, but a larger percentage we kill for fun. We are not going to use this thing, we just kill them for the fun of it. You know, so that's pain. I had that pain growing up and I knew I had to do something. And well, growing up and seeing that there are really no laws protecting the wildlife, nobody cares, nobody is bothered, I stepped out to do what I could to conserve wildlife, which is what I have been doing. Apart from this red-capped mangabe, Dr. Mack has rescued pangolin snakes and many animals in the wild. He wants everyone to appreciate nature and embrace wildlife. Ebola is a problem. Um, Ebola carried by white monkeys, yeah? Everybody knows that. You see a monkey, you think of Ebola. Now, the monkeys, their populations have increased unchecked in those regions where they have the Ebola coming to man. Now there is a natural predator that God had put to keep the monkeys in check. Snakes are one of their predators. Crocodiles, you mentioned, are one of their predators. Tiger, um, lions, um, leopards, these big cats are their predators. They keep the population in check and they are not susceptible to Ebola. But because we have hunted these guys out of, uh, out, out, out of the forest, yes, the monkeys' population have gone unchecked, so they bring the Ebola to us. You understand? So there is a balance. Nature has organized itself into a balance. We are the ones that tip that balance. Now also in Nigeria, a couple, yes, in the last couple of uh, years, months, we've had problem with um, Lassa fever. Lassa fever is transmitted by the multimammalate rats, rats especially. And then leptospirosis is on the increase. It is a bacterial disease that is transmitted by the rats. Now you didn't think you needed the snakes, but the snakes, their major prey is the rats. So they keep the rat population in check. But we have killed them and hunted them all out of, uh, 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 around us. The rat population is coming out unchecked. So we have tilted the balance and we are paying for it. The challenges of population growth are clear, not least the threat to biodiversity from increased pollution, deforestation, intensive agriculture and urbanization. Because the stakes are high, there is a heated debate over how to tackle the issue. Their skin freshly, yeah. it has a sheen and looks like suede. It doesn't look scaly like this. A snake enthusiast, Mark Ofoa, wants people to live in harmony with nature. And let me tell you one beautiful thing about them. When you hold and you hold firmly, yeah. you become like a tree all of a sudden. You are no longer a threat. For real.
Do you know you're not friend. even breathing hard, you're not sweating, you're, there's no sign of fear. So you can do it. Snakes, because um, they carry venom, we have some that are venomous and all that, we endear people to just be careful, just respect. The first thing is, if you're in the wild or you're in your bush or you're in your backyard, you see a snake, the first thing you should do is stop moving. Just freeze. Yes. Just freeze, I'm telling you. No matter how venomous that snake is going to be, there won't be a bite. Once the snake sees you're not a threat, it's going to plan an escape. They don't want to bite you. They don't want to have problems with you. Um, these two ball pythons I'm carrying right now, they are rescues. If you can see, you can see this car. This is a rope trap. Cut it and cut a deep gash into it. You understand? So when I got there, I told them what I did. I didn't pay for him. I told them, that, look, this animal, this place is already infected. It's going to die. So it's not useful to you. I convinced them to give it up and I got him. So I treated him and by the time he was well, he had already imprinted on me. Other snakes that I rescue without injuries, I release to the wild. But I can't release these guys again because I have imprinted on them and uh, they, are, they don't have the fear of humans. Mark is one of many conservationists I have met this year who are worried about the unsustainable way we live with nature and who are working hard at reversing the trend. Monkeys are killed. We have monkeys coming to our backyards and all that. And what people plan is killing. Either they poison food or they throw stones at them or some people with guns shoot them, set traps and all that. I've seen all sorts. But what we should actually be thinking of is trapping these species and relocating them to somewhere safe. That way we are still conserving nature. We haven't killed them, we have relocated them. The population is still viable outside there. Dr. Idem Enyang, who lives in Uyo, is one of them. His Biodiversity Preservation Center in Odokitan in Uyo is home to different species of snakes. Feel it, feel it. I'm supporting it. <laughs> Crocodiles. <laughs> tortoises. Monitor lizards See? and many more. Now one's setting the tail to whip me. Mm. Mm, that's what it does. This is what they call Nigerian dwarf crocodile. They come, you know, hide underwater. The algae, the white uh, 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 unicellular plants growing there, covers their skin, they feel at home. They come out. I, I deliberately grow this, uh, I grow this algal bloom that you see here. This is what they call beggar weed. So that's what I use in mimicking the natural environment. You can see it growing on the edges of the pond. So what they do, they come here from the beginning. They sweep virtually with their legs. They use their back legs and pack this refuse deliberately and put it there for nest to lay the egg. She's, you can see how gravid she is. She wants to is lay this the man? That's a man. And that's the wife there. Yeah. So she has virtually piled a huge heap. Sometimes you have to pack uh, leaves, fallen leaves, and come and add to her for her to make that much nest. So all the eggs will be buried there and it incubates itself because the rotting leaves generate heat inside. Because that's naturally the way they incubate their eggs. They don't sit on it like chicken do. They allow the rotting vegetation inside that heap. The heat is generated when it's rotting. That's what helps to incubate the egg. The temperature determines what sex the baby will be. A higher temperature will bring out males. A lower temperature will bring out females. So she needs a balanced temperature. That's why she does the hip so big. So the eggs that are underneath will receive higher temperature. The ones above will receive lower temperature because the heat is higher as you go deeper. So that's what they do. And it's very interesting because even as a scientist, you may not see this in the wild. But keeping this thing in this enclosure has given us the opportunity to see and understand its biology much more than what you read in textbooks. Dr. Enyang established the Biodiversity Preservation Center in 1996, and it is dedicated to the protection and preservation of Nigerian biodiversity through field biological researches, conservation education, outreach programs, anti-bushmeat campaigns, and provision of alternatives to bushmeat. Yeah, what happens in conservation science from the world over, there is what we call, for instance, a voucher specimen. 
the voucher specimen is the Jesus Christ that died for all of us. So it's permitted for you to take a few representative population or individual and keep for the purposes of educating the people that impact on their environment, impact on their population, to learn from this individual in favor of those still left in the wild. If you have successfully convinced the persons who visit here that it's good to conserve the crocodile, it's not only good as bushmeat, you can farm them, you can do this and that, it all adds you know, positively in the value chain for conservation. Relentless pursuit of economic growth, trained with the impact of climate change, has put an unprecedented one million species at risk of extinction. Only a wide-ranging transformation of the global economic and financial system could pull ecosystems that are vital to the future of human communities worldwide back from the brink of collapse. This was concluded by the report, which was produced by the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services and endorsed by 130 countries. We're losing biodiversity, we're losing species at a historical rate, potentially 500,000 to a million species are threatened with loss. We've lost much of our native forests, much of our native wetlands, and effectively biodiversity needs to be considered as an equally important issue as climate change. It's not just an environmental issue. It is an economic issue, a development issue, a security issue, uh, a social, moral and ethical issue. The time for action clearly is now. Compiled by 145 expert authors from 50 countries, the study is a cornerstone of an emerging body of research that suggests the human race may need to embrace a new post-growth form of economics if it is to avert the existential risks posed by the mutually reinforcing consequences of pollution, habitat destruction and carbon emissions. As we lose biodiversity, it threatens human well-being. All the way, as I've said, from food security, water security, energy security. Also, loss of natural resources in some parts of the world can lead to conflict uh, between people, basically. And especially poor people are hurt, and therefore they're most dependent on natural resources. Known as the Global Assessment, the report found that up to 1 million of the world's estimated 8 million plant, insect and animal species is at risk of extinction, many within decades. The authors identified industrial farming and fishing as major drivers, with the current rate of species extinction tends to hundreds of times higher than the average over the last 10 million years. Climate change caused by burning the coal, oil and gas produced by the fossil fuel industry was exacerbating the losses the report found. The problem with our economic system today is we have some very, very perverse subsidies in the agricultural sector, in the transportation sector and the energy sector. And those subsidies normally lead, on average, to destruction or adverse effects on the environment. So the first thing is we need to reform a whole subsidy issue. We need to have incentives in place for clean technologies, clean practices. We need to recognize not just GDP, it, or gross domestic product, is a measure of economic growth. We have to recognize that nature is a major thing of natural capital, along with human capital, built capital, and social capital. The report finds that around 1 million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction, many within decades, more than ever before in human history. The 2019 Global Assessment Blood Language echoed the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a parallel UN-backed panel which said in October that profound changes in modern economies and societies will be needed to curb greenhouse gases quickly enough to avert the most devastating consequences of a warming world. The assessment shows a planet in which human footprint is so large it leaves little space for anything else. Three quarters of the land-based environment and about 66 percent of the marine environment have been significantly altered by human activities. More than a third of the world's land surface and nearly 75 percent of freshwater resources are now devoted to crop or livestock production. 
The value of agricultural crop production has increased by about 300% since 1970. Raw timber harvest has risen by 45% and approximately 60 billion tons of renewable and non-renewable resources are now extracted globally every year, having nearly doubled since 1980. So there's no question we have to start to put emphasis on getting rid of harmful subsidies, promoting good practice, sustainable consumption and use, and effectively recognise the importance that nature is an asset to be managed carefully. I think it is a terrible indictment. Now this report causes Desmond Majakudum in some pain. As a nature lover, he started the Lekki Urban Forest, an animal sanctuary initiative, which sits on 20 hectares of land along the Lekki Ekme Expressway. Lufasi is an urban forest dedicated for people to connect and interact with nature. Majakudumi says, as we are a part of nature, it is time we developed in harmony with it. Everything that we need for our life support, it comes from nature, including the oxygen that comes from these wonderful green leaves in Lufasi Park right behind me, our most essential commodity, not to mention the water, not to mention the arable land, it all comes from nature. And if in this process of so-called development, you're destroying the capability of nature to supply this, and the web of life that the creatures give is also part of that life support system, then it is not development. Development must be something that is done in harmony with nature. You know, human beings for too long, for the last few hundred years, especially because of the Western ideology, we have felt that we are apart from nature, whereas we are a part of nature. And as far as, you know, Africans are concerned, this has always been the case until very recently. We have lived far more harmoniously with nature until we embrace this uh, so-called development of the colonialists, which they themselves are now realizing that it's a wrong direction and they're trying to re-divert it and bring it back to a harmonious way with nature. The cities that they're developing now are cities that are actually in harmony. They're developing green cities because it's sustainable. If you're going to destroy the ecosystems, then it's not sustainable and it's not development. Yes, we can develop. Yes, we should develop. But we must do it in harmony with nature. Land degradation has reduced the productivity of 23% of the global land surface. Up to $577 billion in annual global crops are at risk from pollinator loss and between 100 and 300 million people are at increased risk of floods and hurricanes because of loss of coastal habitat and protection. In 2015, 33% of marine fish stocks were being harvested at unsustainable levels. 60% were maximally sustainably fished, but just 7% harvested at levels lower than what can be sustainably fished. Urban areas have been more than doubled since 1992. There is no doubt that this is certainly the most comprehensive report ever written with an incredible amount of detail. But at the same time, we should recognize that the basic message is the same as what the scientific community has been saying for more than 30 years. Biodiversity is important in its own right. Biodiversity is important for human well-being, and we humans are destroying it. Plastic pollution has increased tenfold since 1980. Between 300 and 400 million tons of heavy metals, solvent, toxic sludge and other waste from industrial facilities are dumped annually into the world's waters. And fertilizers entering coastal ecosystems have produced more than 400 ocean dead zones, totaling more than 245,000 square kilometers, a combined area greater than that of the United Kingdom. If you think of somebody having a really serious disease, which would be the symptoms which is most critical? Which of the analyses from, from the lab will be the most worrying? Actually, none on its own. All the analyses together compose a picture, and the, the, the whole picture, the whole consistent picture, the way they interact with other is the bad news or the good news. The report acknowledges current conservation strategies, such as the creation of protected areas, are well-intended but inadequate. 
Future forecasts indicate negative trends will continue in all scenarios, except those that embrace radical change across society, politics, economics and technology. It says values and goals need to change across governments, so local, national and international policymakers are aligned to tackle the underlying causes of planetary deterioration. Importantly, we have done a lot already. There's enough instruments, international agreements, local policies, local efforts that if more, more boldly deployed and other bold change decisions are made, those pathways to achieve the sustainable development goals uh, are possible. The knowledge is there. We need to move to more bold implementation. And then there are lots of, of species, individual species and habitats that are, that are suffering so significantly that they'll go to extinction. Extinction is permanent, right? So at, at various scales, there are all kinds of irreversibly. In terms of collectively, societally, that's too hard to say, you know? It seems, like, it seems quite clear that we're not there yet, that we still do have time, but we don't have time to dither around. It's time to get started. Healthy biodiversity is the essential infrastructure that supports all forms of life on Earth, including human life. It also provides nature-based solutions on many of the most critical environmental, economic and social challenges that we face as human society, including climate change, sustainable development, health and water and food security. Really what we would like at the end of this report is to really give uh, the world a real message of hope. We don't want that people feel discouraged, that uh, there is nothing that can be done, that we've lost the battle because we have not lost the battle. And if given a chance, nature will reconquer its rights and will prevail. And so we really want everyone to feel that they can contribute, that they are part uh, of the solution. And this is very much the main message uh, that this uh, report is um, bringing to the world. A revolution has started amongst the young people and they have a weapon of warfare and this is the weapon of the warfare that they have. The smartphone, the gadget that links them up all over the world. The young people have a global problem and they have a global way of uniting themselves with this weapon. And it's the young people that are taking the lead and they are demanding of the elders. They are saying that you have no right to destroy our future and they are insisting that we start doing our so-called development in the right way that we start living in harmony with nature that we stop destroying the web of life experts believe the global assessment of biodiversity and ecosystem services adds a major element to the body of evidence for the importance of biodiversity to efforts to achieve the zero hunger objective amid the sustainable development goals. Together, assessment undertaken by the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, as well as Food and Agriculture Organization and Convention on Biological Diversity and other organizations point to the urgent need for action to better conserve and sustainable use biodiversity to the importance of cross-sectoral and multidisciplinary collaboration among decision makers and other stakeholders at all levels. The chair of the study said biodiversity is important in its own right. Biodiversity is important for human well-being and we, as humans, are destroying it. The beautiful thing is, it is possible to start conserving, restoring and using nature sustainably if societies were prepared to confront vested interests committed to preserving the status quo. And that means each one of us must do something. That's our program for the day. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.